Thank you, Lord. We thank you and praise you for this day, Lord. We rejoice and we're glad in it. I just thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be here, to bring forth your word today. And I ask, Lord Jesus, that, that everything that's, that I say, everything that's brought forth today will glorify you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, thank you, Lord. You know, yesterday as I was preparing the message, it was a beautiful day yesterday, wasn't it? And dare I say it, there was a touch of fall in the air mm -hmm. yesterday. Anybody else? I mean, I don't know. There was just a touch of fall in the air. Oh, yeah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Well, I know that we can all agree that this last year and a half, or two years, has been quite a ride, hasn't it? Yes. Can we all agree on that? Yes. yes, indeed. Amen. And there's a photo I want to share with you today. Thank you, Lord. So this was taken while we were camping a few years ago now, I think. So it's been a little while, and I immediately thought of this. It came to mind while I was preparing this message, and I had to go and look for it because uh, I couldn't find it. I was searching around. And the photo is, a, well, in the boat is uh, Jody, uh, Josiah, and Gemma, and myself. We went out, out on our boat. When we go camping, of course, our days are usually pretty active and adventurous, and people usually sleep pretty well at night, and uh, Gemma, of course, typically goes 100%, right? And literally until she can't go anymore. And this day, as we were out on the water, and I fired up the motor, and we started bouncing along on the waves, Gemma literally just fell over asleep, and Josiah caught her. Now, we had seen this happen twice before that day. Each time I started the motor, and we were moving along, pounding on those waves, boom, 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 boom. She just instantly went to sleep, <laughs> and she just started to fall over. So this time, Josiah was prepared, and. We were moving along pretty good, boom, 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 and he simply reached out and caught her and held her like that as she slept, and she bounced to the rhythm of the boat, boom. <laughs> Hitting the waves, we went along all the way back to the dock. Pretty neat picture, I'll have to show it to her, I don't know that she... She probably doesn't even know about this event. We'll probably have to share it with her. She would probably find it just pretty amazing. Pretty funny. <clears throat> Praise God. And for quite a while now, you know, the church remnant, as we talked about this last year and a half, has, has been quite a ride. For quite a, quite a while, the church remnant has been fighting intensely. Kind of like the pounding of those waves. Boom, 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 boom. And God's people have been standing and engaging in a spiritual battle, the likes of which we have not seen before. And as time goes on, we, we must not get lulled to sleep because this is the third great awakening. Amen. And the good news is, is the awaker is here. Amen. The awaker is here. The one who awakens. And let's turn this morning to 1 Samuel 3, 1. Yes. 
think she'll see it. Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. And it came to pass at that time, while Eli was lying down in his place, and when his eyes had begun to grow dim, so dim that he could not see, and before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down, that the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here I am. So he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And he said, I did not call. Lie down again. And he went and lay down. Then the Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. He answered, I did not call my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, so he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you did call me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be if he calls you, that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord gives Samuel a nice, gentle awakening here, doesn't he? And it reminds me, I've shared this many times, of my mom waking me when I was a young boy. It's time to rise and shine. It's time to open the biggie blues. Very different from having a drill sergeant yell at you and flip you out of your bunk, for instance. There are some people who are going to receive what you might call a shock or a rude awakening. But honestly, better that than to not wake up at all. Sleep has been studied a great deal, and we know that in the physical realm there are levels of sleep. People talk about a deep sleep or being a light sleeper. There is REM sleep, where people often dream. And you know, there are levels uh, of being awake as well. You'll hear people say things like, I'm not fully awake yet, or I don't wake until after I've had my coffee, or I'm so tired I can't think straight. We used to always say, <clears throat> wake up and smell the coffee, as a kind of cajole for someone to get with it. You know, get with it. Wake up, smell the coffee, get with it. Spiritually, there are levels of being awake as well. Here, the Lord is waking Samuel up physically and spiritually to a greater revelation and waking him up to his destiny. Revelation was rare in those days. Wow, that one always just blows my mind when I meditate on it. It's hard to even imagine today because we live in a time of such great revelation. We are so very blessed. Let's pick up with verse 10. <clears throat> now the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel. Samuel. And Samuel answered, Speak, for your servant hears. And now I love this here. This is one of those subtleties in the Bible when you're reading the Word that just stand out to you sometimes and you just marvel at it. Because, you know, before the three times, God said Samuel one time. And now he says it twice. And, I, and as I'm reading it, I get the picture of a person kneeling next to a bed and, and gently waking somebody. You know, like, Joseph. Joseph, wake up. I have something to tell you. 
I want to turn to the truth in action in my Bible here at the end of this chapter. If you don't have it or you don't want to turn there, you can just listen. Truth in action number two, and we're going to read number four as well. It says, though Samuel grew up serving the Lord, his real influence came after knowing him through a personal encounter. Personally encountering God is the key to knowing him intimately. Listen for God's voice. Know that he calls you by name. Respond as Samuel did, with an open and receptive heart, willing to obey. And number four, truth in action. Samuel's life reveals the faith lifestyle of reaching out to and trusting in God, even in the face of previously unknown experiences and seemingly insurmountable odds. Respond with an open and obedient heart when the Lord reveals his love to you through correction or instruction. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. His love to you. He reveals his love to you by talking to you, by giving you instruction, by telling you something, by correcting you. He loves you. He does it because he loves you. Now let's continue with verse 11. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. Their ears will tingle, meaning it's going to get everyone's attention. It's going to be astonishing, even shocking. You might say, a wake-up call. Verse 13, For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows because his sons made themselves vile, and he did not restrain them. And therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Judgment. There will now be a harvest for the wickedness sown by the house of Eli, because God is preparing to do something new, something big. And this is not unknown sin but known sin that Eli allowed to continue, and it stopped him from receiving revelation. God stopped talking to him. And when we don't address known sin in our lives, it can also have the same impact. Now there's grace and provision for unknown sin, and God will also reveal it to us so that we can repent. But when you ignore God and continue in known sin, it blocks revelation from God. And there will eventually be a harvest of judgment if there's not repentance. Verse 15. So Samuel lay down until morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He answered, Here I am. And he said, What is the word that the Lord spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. God, do so to you, and more also, if you hide anything from me of all the things that he has said to you. Then Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. So Samuel grew and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. Then the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Now there is a prophet in the nation that fears God, and revelation is going to flow again. 
Now, in a message recently, I shared that I like metal detecting. And I talked about trash versus treasure. This past week, I had a few minutes, and I, I went metal detecting by myself. And as it usually goes, for those of you who have never metal detected, uh, you, know, you swing your detector, and what you walk along, and you listen for the sounds, and you look for the signals, and I got a signal that sounded good, and you have to make a choice whether or not you want to dig. You don't dig every sound. You'd, you'd be stuck. You wouldn't, you know, you'd just be digging everything up. Uh, a lot of trash. So you have to think, you know, discern, you know, do I want to dig that? And I got a, a signal that sounded good, and I dug a hole, and I pulled out a small button pen, about this big small button pen, and I held it up to look at it, and it said, wake up, wake up. As I pulled that little pen out of the hole and read it, I heard the still small voice of the Lord, and my response was simply, Lord, what are you saying to me? And after pausing for a minute, I put it back in my pocket and continued on, still kind of meditating on it as I went. Now in that message I mentioned, I talked about finding treasure. And as far as that goes, it really doesn't get any better than the Lord speaking to you. <laughs> Praise God. I found the Lord speaking to me, metal detecting. Put that one on your bucket list. And for those of you who don't know, detectorists keep a bucket list, a list of things they've found and want to find. If you don't believe that God speaks this way to his people, then you either don't know him or you're simply not listening. He talks to his people personally. Just like he did with Samuel. It really amazes me that Revelation was rare in those days. But today he speaks to his people continuously, even while metal detecting. So the next night, <clears throat> I was watching Prophet Robin Bullock in his ministry, The Eleventh Hour. <clears throat> and Jody had left the room, so I was sitting on the couch by myself. And it was early. It was about 8 o'clock, 8 p.m. But I was exhausted. I was exhausted in a strange way, a, a deep exhaustion. And I started falling asleep. Not laying down, I was sitting up, kind of like Gemma in the boat, except my head was falling back. Now, I don't do this. This was an unusual thing. I, I'm never that tired at that time. But I literally just could not stay awake. I just kept falling asleep. And then I was awakened hearing Robin say, Jeremy. And the Lord spoke to me through Robin. <clears throat> now when Jody came back <clears throat> later, she came into the room, it was over. Right? And so I, I had rewound it to that point and said, simply just listen to this. And when it was done, you know what she said to me? Do you remember what you said? <laughs> she doesn't remember. Well, you said, did that wake you up? <laughs> I did. <laughs> Praise Jesus. Now she knew, I think she probably knew that I was starting to nod off before she left the room. But she didn't know anything about the wake up pen that I found, or anything else. I hadn't shared anything with her. <clears throat> and what Robin shared, I received. But also understood from the Lord that I was supposed to pass it on to you. And he said, <clears throat> Lift up your hands, for I am calling you into your call now. 
This is the time you have waited for. You have said, if I just knew what I was supposed to do. The Lord says, here is what you are supposed to do. Lift up your hands and say, I will follow you, Lord. And from that point on, I will show you what you are supposed to do. Start prophesying to the horizon. Start prophesying to the horizon what you want to come. You see it rising, and you call it into your life right now. God is calling all of you in. This is the time you must begin to stand up and do something. This is your time. Lord, give them courage to rise up. Let's turn to Romans 13, 11. And do this knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Philosopher and writer Frank Herbert has a quote that has always caught my attention. He said, without change, something sleeps inside us and seldom awakens. The sleeper must awaken. Now we're not talking about change just for change's sake. God does not change. And there are things you don't change. Like his word. And like our nation's flag, for instance. Amongst many other things. If you haven't heard the same people who rewrite history... The further evil agenda have recently proposed changing our flag. But the change I am referring to is about new revelation from God. Increase, growth, transformation, and moving to fulfill your destiny. Let's turn to Romans 8.12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits 
for the revealing of the sons of God. We are all children of God, but our destiny is to be sons of God. Let's turn to Acts 7.51. Actually, just don't turn there. Let, let me just read it for you. This was part of Stephen's address before the Jewish high priest and ruling council for which he was stoned. And I'm actually going to read it from the Passion Translation. This is Acts 7.51. Why would you be so stubborn as to close your hearts and your ears to me? You are always opposing the Holy Spirit, just like your forefathers. It's not okay for the people of God to remain asleep, to stay stuck in sin or broken. God says, my people, my sheep, hear my voice. And we are in a time of supernatural breakthrough for God's people. Repentance, healing, restoration, deliverance, and revelation. Be expectant for these things to happen quickly quickly in people's lives. What might have taken years in the past will happen rapidly. I had a vision a month or so ago, and I believe it is also concerning the nation as a whole, but I knew that it was for this area right here, because that's where my heart was. And it was from the perspective of a shepherd with a flock of sheep. And the sheep were moving up into the top of a large field. Now the field had been completely grazed and was brown and dry. And there was a path leading out of the top of the field to an upper field that you could see up in the distance. And it was beautiful and green. And the sheep were bunching up and started to bump into each other because there were four sheep that were standing sideways, intentionally blocking the path so that the other sheep could not enter. There were wolves circling in the rear of the flock. And it was obvious that the four blocking sheep were working with the wolves to trap the sheep. And the Lord spoke saying, I am going to remove those sheep that are blocking the way. And that was it. The four sheep blocking the path are representative of the religious, pharisaical spirit in the church. Working with the spirit of Baal and Jezebel, who's under Baal, the controlling, manipulating spirits that operate in the governmental realm. <coughs> Let's turn to Matthew 23, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. And the Passion Translation says it this way, Great sorrow awaits you, religious scholars and Pharisees, such frauds and pretenders. You do all you can, to keep people from experiencing the reality of heaven's kingdom realm. Not only do you refuse to enter in, you also forbid anyone else from entering in. The upper pasture is a greater revelation. Power, authority, equipping, strength, blessings, provision, abundance, everything that is needed for God's people a new era, a great awakening, and a tremendous increase in harvest of souls. 
The Bible warns to be aware of false prophets and false teachers, especially in the last days. And it's not really mysterious at all as to who they are. Now, I remember a time when I read that and I would think that it was somewhat of a mystery. And I would be concerned as to whether or not I would recognize them. We see it obviously today with those who are, con they continually resist the Holy Spirit and call themselves people of faith, yet aligned with the culture of the day and ruling principalities and powers against what God says and His Word. And if you know the Word of God and operate in the gift of discernment, which is for all believers, it's no mystery at all as to who the false prophets and teachers are. They are continuously in opposition to God. We planted a simple garden at home this year. Tomatoes, Swiss chard, cucumber, and different varieties of squash. And the plants got off to a good start. And the weather was pretty good early on, and I did lots of watering. But then the cucumber beetles came. And I had to fight them off. And I was battling for the harvest. Three times the cucumber beetles came back. And I don't think I've ever had to contend with them that much. But the plants came through, and there was a promise of a big harvest because you could see that there was little squash everywhere. And as the squash continued to grow, I started to notice that a few were being eaten. And then more, and then more. And again, I had to defend the harvest, this time from woodchucks. And it got so bad that I really wasn't sure I was going to be able to get any squash at all. Now we should have been eating squash every night for a couple weeks and giving some away based upon what was there. But we hadn't even harvested a single one, not even a single one. And that's hard to do with squash. Now, I have never had a woodchuck problem this bad. I had already taken out two woodchucks, but they were still stealing our harvest, literally eating all of the beautiful squash just before I got them. And I said, enough's enough. I'll have to do something, or there will be absolutely no harvest at all. And I prayed, and I took authority over the pests, those woodchucks, and I rebuked them. And that night, I took out two more woodchucks. In one night, a banner day, two woodchucks in one night. <laughs> and four days later, we harvested and ate our first squash of the year. It was... Hallelujah! There was harvest! We ate, and it was good. Hallelujah. What is happening right now is that the third great awakening is here, and the enemy is trying to steal the harvest. Let's turn to Judges 6.1. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. Because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds which are in the mountains. Lord is Lord God, or Yahweh Elohim, God in his system of seed, plant, and harvest. 
Before the fall, the earth simply produced for man. It was effortless. But after the fall, man would have to toil to get the earth to produce. In this system of seed, plant, and harvest after the fall, man is always sowing but still has the power to choose what seeds he sows, to choose between life and death. We have the power to sow and reap, sow good seeds and reap a good harvest. Nobody would honestly sow beans and expect to reap corn. There was a big harvest yesterday at the Thomas house. You heard about that this morning. They had bought little chicks that came forth through seed, raised them to maturity, and then there was the harvest. At no point did those chickens turn into ducks or tomatoes. Very simply, what you sow is what you reap. And here, Israel is reaping a harvest of the evil seed that they had sown. <clears throat> This is such an important concept for believers to understand. Everyone must understand this because you are participating in this system whether you know it or not. Everybody is. And you are continuously sowing. And when you really understand this, it will change how you speak and how you live. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. Everywhere you go, you know you're sowing seeds. Everything you do, you're sowing seeds. You know it. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. Verse 3. So it was, whenever Israel had sown, Midianites would come up. Also, Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. Then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents, coming in as numerous as locusts. Both they and their camels were without number, and they would enter the land to destroy it. So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, and it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel who said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. Also, I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizrite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. Gideon was in the winepress because the enemy was stealing the harvest and he's threshing the wheat in hiding so that it wouldn't be stolen. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. The Lord is commissioning Gideon, calling him, waking him up to his destiny. He's saying enough is enough. I'm calling you and giving you power and authority to put an end to this. The enemy will no longer steal the harvest and devastate my people. Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? You shall do this. Why? Because I'm sending you. 
Samuel heard the word of the Lord and responded, Here I am, Lord. In Isaiah 6, 8, Isaiah says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Let's turn to Matthew 9.35. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary. That's harassed. They were harassed. They were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Jesus says, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. And then he gives them authority and he sends them out. He sends them out. Jesus is Lord of the harvest. He's sending us. He's sending me. He's sending you. Amen. 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 Do you have spiritual authority in the world, in, in the nations of the world? The answer is yeah. Yeah, you, you have authority there. You have some authority there. And here it New Beginning Miracle Fellowship, there is an anointing and an authority to pray for the nations as well. It's as a hub, there's a, an anointing here, an authority for that. But you have authority. Yes, you have authority in the nations. Do you have authority in the United States of America? Yes. Yeah. Yes, Even more so... <laughs> Because you are a citizen of this nation. Amen. And this nation is in covenant relationship with God. Amen. And God has put you here for a reason. Do you have even greater spiritual authority in Vermont? Yes. You betcha. Again, God has put you here. Amen. This is your home state for a reason. Do you have an even greater level of authority in the Lamoille Valley, the region where you live? Amen. You absolutely do. Do you have an incredibly powerful authority in your hometown? Yes. And in Morrisville, the heart of the region you live in and where your church is? Yes, you have incredible spiritual authority right now here. Yes. Yes. Do you have even more authority over your house yes. and your own life? Yes. Absolutely. This is the place of your greatest authority. You are a prophet of your own life. Yes. Did you ever notice that the enemy tries to distract you away from and disconnect you from the areas of your greatest authority? The places that God has called you to be and given you great authority and influence. It could be that he does this through trials and tribulations, offenses and hurts or various lies and deceptions. However, he can do it. It could be the grass is greener syndrome. Somewhere else is better than here. Thoughts of faraway exotic places. And unfortunately, there are a lot of disconnected, broken, homeless, vagabond Christians. But I believe that many of them right now are waking up to their destiny and being planted. Yes. 
where God would have them. And with authority comes great, awesome responsibility and accountability. We are accountable for that which God has given us authority over. So what is the state of our lives, our homes, our towns, our region of influence? How can the Lamoille Valley be anything other than holy ground? How can Morrisville, Vermont be anything other than a righteous city, a city that glorifies God? Followers of Jesus Christ live here, go to church here, shop here, drive these roads and walk the streets. Mighty men and women of valor are here. The enemy is trying to steal the harvest to prevent the third great awakening from happening. By bringing about the Antichrist world system prematurely. The people are being oppressed with intense, crushing pressure. Literally, the enemy is trying to crush their souls. The Greek word for this is thalipsis. Sparkling Gems by Rick Renner has the following. It says, one scholar says it, Thalipsis, was first used to describe the specific act of tying a victim with rope, imagine this, laying him on his back, and then placing a huge boulder on top of him until his body was crushed. Thalipsis describes a situation so difficult that it causes one to feel stressed, squeezed, pressured, or crushed, always indicating a level of intensity that is almost unbearable in the natural. This describes how the devil will try to use circumstances or events in life to put you under so much pressure that you eventually break, throwing in the towel and giving up. Sound familiar? The enemy is trying to do this to people throughout the world and right here in our land, our region, and the people are starting to groan and cry out to be made free. And there are people rising up everywhere by the hundreds of thousands. Do not listen to what's, what the false prophets and false teachers say. It's happening. Do you identify with Joshua and Caleb or with the other ten that went out to spy the promised land? Are the giants in Mooresville bigger than our God? Are the giants in the Lamoille Valley bigger than our God? No. Are the giants in Vermont bigger than our God? No. The word says Joshua and Caleb were of a different spirit. Remember that it is the anointing that breaks the yoke of bondage. Let's help make some people free and help secure harvest the likes of which nobody has ever seen. God has given me a vision for Morrisville. As a shining city that radiates throughout the Lamoille Valley. It's what I see when I look at Morrisville. Now, blowing the shofar is, amongst other things, a wake-up call. And I'm going to make a declaration and blow the shofar right now. <coughs> Morrisville, wake up to your destiny. city set upon a hill that cannot be hidden. <laughs> Morrisville is a righteous city, a holy city. Morrisville glorifies God.
mighty men and women of valor, wake up to your destiny. Yes. And I'm going to ask Jody to come up and help me with this part. As we sing these two verses, I'm going to blow the shofar. I ask you to sing Awake, O Morrisville, and then Awake, O Lamoil Valley. Can join in, right? And you all join in. You know this song well. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Awake, O oh Morrisville, put off your slumber, and the truth shall make you free. God, let us go our way rejoicing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.